I've been studying this problem for a reasonably long time. I'm very kind of uh, when I mentioned the quarter century. It's actually two years, I didn't know. That. <laughs> uh, last count is uh, 41 going north. Um, uh, Frank Kukuyama commented, I think he's since changed his mind, but the end of history, it was about the 1991 ish time frame. Uh, I went to uh, NSA in uh, 1992. And the watchwords in the town were peace dividend. And what that meant was uh, they want the money back. Uh, for my time there, uh, NSA uh, in the 80s had grown significantly. This was period of Cold War, unfortunately, kind of work at the closure. And uh, the hiring levels were pretty significant. Um, for my four years there, it was fewer than 200 people a year. What that did was shift us into a focus of, since NSA is a technical organization, we could only hire one of four kinds of people. Uh, it had to be an electrical engineer, a computer science specialist, a language or a mathematician. And interestingly, um, the analytical community does not come from those four primarily. It tends to be for science or international relations or music or history or so on. So you can see what the story I'm about to tell. Um, while uh, it's characteristic of post-Cold War, it's characteristic of every major conflict in the United States. Uh, when we start, we're not quite ready. Uh, we build it up over time, and as soon as it's over, we want to make it smaller. And so I think it was probably, from, from hindsight, uh, probably made it a little too small, a little too much downsizing post-Cold uh, War, and then I think we will suffer the consequences later on. So here we are now, and, the other side of 9-11 trying to refocus and, and rebuild it again. Uh, my topic is the foreign reform intelligence community. I'll spend a little bit of time, uh, bit of time of talking about that. But what I want to capture for you is um, today's the 26th of July. Uh, it's a very important day to me. Uh, it's not only the anniversary of the signing of the National Security Act of 1947, it's my birthday. <laughs> I was four years old. <laughs> but uh, that framed this community, creating not only the uh, Department of Defense and the Air Force, or set the rule of the creator, the DCI, the forerunner of the uh, Director of National Intelligence, created the CIA, and so on. Now, how many times do you think this community has been studied since 1947? <laughs> the answer is over 40, 40 times. And uh, let me give you a couple of quotes. Security clearances take entirely too long. <laughs> they have to be short. That was a study conducted in 1955. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the study concluded 15 months was too long, and I'm happy to report that we got it down to 18 months. <laughs> um, in information technology <coughs> must be connected so we can share information. We currently do not have our information technology systems appropriately connected. Date, 1960. We had two computers. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few more computers today. Guess what? Um, my, the point of the county is uh, it's been studied every other year, about every 18 months. But it's some very influential, very powerful, very important people over 40 times. And it, each of the studies basically is completely the same thing. Um, so I got to serve in the community for 26 years. Um, I went to industry. In industry, I would retain clearances. I was in a contractor or a consultant back to the Defense National Security Intelligence Community. Mm -hmm. Not focused on su substance, you know, content of, of analysis and so on, but process and organization technology and tools and so on. Um, so I stayed close to it. I learned a lot of valuable lessons in the industry about how you deliver things. It's not something that we were particularly experienced in, at least I was particularly experienced, experienced in while serving in government. We tended to take a long time and we tended to rationalize, we tended to debate, we tended not to deliver. Uh, so the lesson learned if you're in the business to make money and you're driven to efficiency, uh, is you have to 
deliver quality and you have to um, do it in an effective and efficient way. And so what happens is you have a delivery mindset. So taking 10 years of industry <coughs> and coming back and thinking about the community, the fir first thing we did was to survey the 40 studies, 40 plus studies, and said what were the major things. So our premise up front is it's been studied to death. Let's think execution. Let's think deliverables. So what I'm going to frame for you here is a little bit of how we're thinking about what is it we're trying to do. We have a lot of piece parts, but we're the major chunks. And how do we get to an execution as opposed to more study? Uh, let me give you a sort of a major pieces. Uh, creating a culture of collaboration. And incidentally, I've got a handout here. Um, this is called 100 Day Plan. It was an effort to um, capture our thinking and set up the deliverables. We have now passed 100 days. I'll give you a report card here this morning. And this particular draft is a uh, 100-day plan follow-up report. Uh, it's in draft. It will be posted on the website, uh, the NI website, next week. So if you're interested, you can see what it is we're going to do, what it would do, and what we're doing about the things that didn't quite get finished. Uh, what's following closely behind that is something else, 500-day plan. Here's the thing. Uh, if you can set up momentum, expectation, pace, in the context of deliverable. Everybody's agreed and debated that's what we're going to deliver. It's amazing the psychology of being judged by your peers if you didn't deliver your piece. And so we've got a war room and a scorecard and the tracking and, and it's very clear who's responsible and <coughs> so the delivery, deliverable approach is served as well. And um, we will continue this finish out three days and we're going to roll it into five hundred days. Let me just give you a feel for how we've done five hundred days. Rather than come in and say, you know, I'm experienced, I'm old, I've been there, I've done it, I've got some answers, here's what we're going to do. We had a framework, we did a draft, and we put it on the website. Uh, thousands of hits and uh, interactions and blogs and discussions, and that you know, we had last spring, I think it was May. And so we've got our draft and both coordinated and agreed, and we're going to roll it out here in a few weeks. Uh, and again, it will create a, a level of expectation, a schedule, and the things we're focused on. And hopefully we'll be able to execute as opposed to study and make some progress. Now, what are the major things? Culture of collaboration. I think oneness. Uh, a lot of the background for this conference and the focus is, is, is the success of the Bill War Nichols Bill. Uh, 86, Jim. Um, I was a product of the Department of Defense. I observed what that did to us. Um, as a member of the Navy, we had our own ships, ground forces, and airplanes. Why do we need those other <coughs> So I sat many times talking about how do we keep those other guys out of our business. Um, go our interesting rules. Very clever. Not only do the Secretary of Defense become the decision authority for virtually everything policy, career development, acquisition, operations, any, any dimension that you can measure, Secretary of Defense clearly in charge. Chain command runs four people. The President, Secretary of Defense, the Ferry Commander, the Joint Task Force. I mentioned joint, because joint means our Navy Air Force, you know, Special Operations Force. That context. Created the greatest fighting force in the world. How did it happen? One of the most clever things about the world is going to be. When it said, you want to be a white officer, you want to be a senior, you don't get promoted unless you're qualified in the US. Now, very cleverly, Jim probably came up with this interesting construct. It said to the Navy, if you want your best and brightest to make a flag, they have to have joints. And those you send to jointness must be promoted at the same or a higher rate than those who stay behind. So you can see the incentives starting to work. Um, maybe we at one time of we have a nuclear submarine community. Every day for 20 years is planned. We couldn't possibly change that plan. And the answer was fine. No plan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
from good faith to move very quickly to be able to achieve some capability that oftentimes would result in invention of new technology. Uh, this was uh, a magnificent thing to watch in the 50s, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s. <coughs> it tended to be a little more bureaucratized when the Cold War was over. Let me give you an example. And you two, the airframe. Uh, but for those of you who may not be familiar with an airframe, um, thinking about it, designing it, debating it, building it, and so on. On average, today, 10 years. You two was thought about and flying in 18 months. 18 months. I'll give you another example. It won't be too specific. Major system. Huge problem. It was thought about and on orbit in just over four years. Now, if we took an airframe today or another thing on orbit, you can plan on 10 to 15 years at probably four to five times the cost. So what we want to do is go back to the special forces. <coughs> we want to take some risk from the player, but let us do those things that we have to do in the interest of the nation for some strategic collection that we're trying to protect the nation's interest in X or Y or Z, whatever the current threat is. Um, modernize the business practices. One of the things we found is, by and large, it's difficult for those of us in government, across government, to tell you what we want. We have lots of money. We spend it in lots of ways. But our accounting procedures for audit are a challenge. And so what we want to be able to do is we are stewards, good stewards of money, thinking we're doing the right thing and serving the nation's interest. And when we get asked, well, what you spend it on? And how effective was it? Then we want to be able to provide commercial quality standards for audit and financial reports. So that's a, that's a way to think about this community. If we try to improve acquisition to go fast, we also want to modernize our business practices so we can do other things. Um, accelerating information sharing. Everybody's got a story about how it worked or didn't work. Um, I would like to cause, have influence in causing this community to change the way it thinks about its mission. Let me go to World War II. Uh, you all probably, if you're interested in this community, you read some of the books. Uh, one of my favorites is The Code Breakers, written by Dr. Kahn. And it tells the story of breaking the German codes, the collaboration between uh, the Allies, the British, the United States, and so on. It's a, it's a fabulous, interesting story. That's where the idea of need to know was born. It, the, inter the fact we were breaking the code was so precious that we did not want the access power to know. Therefore, uh, we go to great lengths to protect backed up. Uh, that became the way we behave. That's, that became part and parcel of the way the community would conduct its operations. Service well in World War II, it rolled over to the Cold War service well. We're in a different era. Threat's different. Now it's terrorism. There are nation state threats, but the real thing we're wrestling with for the most part today is non nation state threats. So how is it that we share information in a more productive and creative way? I would like to challenge the whole idea of need to know. I own it, I control it, you have to demonstrate you need to know. I would rather the analyst have a mindset, I have a responsibility to provide. Now if you think about that for a second, I'm an analyst and I have a responsibility to provide. The first pressure that puts on, uh, on me as an analyst is, who are my customers? Might it be important for the National Counterterrorism Center to set up post 9 11 to look at the terrorism to stop and think about my most important customer might be the chief of police in Seattle? You can imagine a construct where we have sensitive information and embarrassed about the reason. So if, if I think about my customer set, and it turns out, I didn't know it three days ago, but I know it this morning, that the, the chief of police in Seattle is my most important customer. And how do I get that information to them? So it puts a lot of pressure on me as a panelist knowing who am I serving. There's, a, there's another end of that problem. In the intelligence business, an intelligence analyst generally is as good as understanding the sources and methods. How did I get this information? Where did it come from? How can I improve the 
the content or the timeliness or the quality. So knowing sources and methods is absolutely essential for managers to drive the system to get better information. And one of the things that I've been a little bit surprised at is in some circles that I've found, when you ask an analyst, what's the source of that? Well, why would you ask me? It came off the computer. <laughs> uh, signals intelligence, the short hand, short hand is signal. It's a pretty sensitive subject. It's like, what's the source? Signal. Uh, yeah, but what is the source? National security is. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> Can't you see it? It's a signal. When you're asking what is the source, you, you mean the source of the signal information. <coughs> How did you make a judgment? Can we get more of it? How would you evaluate it? So if we adjust this community to the responsibility of the body, put the new stresses on the animals to think differently about who we are, what we do, and what our responsibilities are, and where do we get our information, what um, qualifications or, or confidence can we put in the new <coughs> clear to me that we got this exactly right just yet. Um, Goldwater Nichols, uh, that I mentioned earlier, is very clear. The chain of command and who makes the decisions and so on. In this community, there are 16 agencies. 15 of those agencies work for a cabinet officer. And um, one works uh, nominally for me. Uh, that creates an <laughs> So you can imagine the discussion when we talk about um, I don't know what the answer is. There is, uh, we have the intelligence reform and the terror prevention act of uh, December of 2004. We've gotten some experience. Uh, we've gotten agreement that we're going to uh, recommend to the president a rewrite of Executive Order 1233. 1233 was signed in 1981 by President Reagan. It's been the foundation for this community and how it's operated, what the stories are, how it's conducted business uh, since that time. It, of course, makes no mention of the DNI, so it's kind of interesting to me. Uh, it has no mention of the Department of Land Security. Uh, so all, many, many, many things have changed since that time. Its focus was Cold War. So we're going to attempt in the rewrite of the founding executive board of the community to try to capture a lot of these things a la the lower Nichols for the community to see if we can make some of these uh, changes going forward. There are many other things that we need to clean up and improve. Um, most, not most, many of the things that we have today in terms of authority grew out of a point in time when the mission and focus was different, or the technology was different, and probably the one that's uh, uh, most of interest and pressing at the moment is FISA, and shorthand for Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Written for a good purpose, written for the right reasons. 28 or so years old, that's how now I'm 78. Um, but it was written at a time when technology was eliminated. And in today's environment, technology is entirely reversed. Um, in those days, when we did collection, almost all international communications was wireless. And today, almost all 90% of all communications is wire, link, fiber optics, photons instead of electrons. So if your whole world is changed from one day to the next, and you understand for this community to collect information on wire, requires a warrant, for a foreign electric, foreign target, foreign terrorist, talking to a foreigner, you've got to have a warrant. So it's kind of, it's kind of got the, Part for the horse here. So we're working very closely with Congress. Bill's on the telephone. Dialogue with all the committees and that's very active consideration. We're trying to get the closure to just change the wording. Because right now, uh, we have this huge backlog trying to get warrants for things that are totally foreign and threatening to this country. So we're working pretty hard. Uh, I think, uh, Jim, that's okay. I'll just stop and we'll get some questions and see where you're going to My task here is to ask about the extension of the IP time, the reform of the performance of the intelligence community in the context of jointness, and why we chose to go about 
the committee was established. Uh, it was served reasonably well, but it wasn't like doing foreign collection that we could do in <coughs> minutes or seconds. It, it was committed. And you had to talk about it and get agreement and submit your request and get approval and so on. So that leads us into Katrina. <coughs> uh, lesson learned from there is now um, a tighter organization administered by the Department of Homeland Security that has professionals that understand all these systems and sensors and have years of experience. They know if they want to turn them on, they can authorize it. So, uh, in terms of capability, is it perfect? No. But it can go fast and it's, it's pretty capable. Uh, one thing I just, I just, the way I would frame it with you, I believe that's sort of an idea. If the United States government wants to know, we have the ability to know because we can focus so much capability on a given area of the world or, or, or where. So in the context of security in the country, if we want to know something, uh, a hurricane or conditions in the city or a catastrophe or whatever, we can, we can look and know a great deal. And so now the system is set up like that. Now, if you didn't ask about threats, I might answer it anyway. Um, the NIE we just released, this is on my mind, so I want to share it with you. Uh, the National Intelligence Estimate on Terrorist Threat to Homeland is just released. Uh, I want to break it into four parts. Committed, adaptive, and capable leadership. I got it. Rebuilding the operatives that can plan and train and control external operations, they've reestablished. A place to train and operate they have, it's called Pakistan, referred to as uh, shorthand as Fatah, federally administered tribal area. It's in that border region up in the mountains between uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. It's never been governed from the outside in its history. And when pa Pakistan the nation was created, it was separate and autonomous. Al-Qaeda is operating right there. So of the first three of the first four things they have to have, leadership, operatives and safe place to train to have them. What they don't have that we have been able to identify are operatives here in this country. They have operatives. They reached out to establish uh, training and delivery paths and passports and visas or countries who don't require visas. Uh, last year there were 50 million visitors to this country. 70% of them did not require a visa. So if you think about terrorism, where would you recruit someone to conduct a terrorist act? So it's, the intent is clear. Uh, and let me give you just a way to think about an intent versus capability. Cold War, capabilities are pretty easy. <coughs> Big things, ships, airplanes, missiles, tank divisions. Not too hard to find them, it's not hard to hide them difficult to conceal it. So we generally have a very good capability to know the order of battle, order of battle or the capabilities of an enemy. What we found uh, very challenging was know the intent. Terrorism is just the opposite. Intent is clearly stated. Committed, adaptive. What we have difficulty with is the capability because it's a single human being or two human beings or three they're trying to be covert, they are going into a neighborhood to buy commercially available components to create a huge explosive. So um, we're better at looking at a Katrina. We're still challenged in finding single human beings that are whose purpose is to say covert. Three years ago, when I was at the Navy, I shared an office with Jack Warren. And it was at the time when Sam Turner was reducing our human intelligence. And I remember Jack saying to me, the problem with that is the satellites will not be able to tell us what's being said inside the mosque. So my question for you is, what are we doing in terms of human intelligence, building up the <coughs> kind of capability, the um, language and area knowledge that we had back during the Cold War, I don't see where that's coming from these days, and see that we're losing. Thank you, very good question. Um, 
clearly recognized in the administration and uh, equally as importantly on the Hill. So we've got a consensus that we have to rebuild it and rebuild it significantly. The graduating class for human training that just was completed a few weeks ago, the largest in our history, uh, it was a mixed class um, of not only uh, CIA training for case officers, but it included uh, Department of Defense and uh, a, a wide cross-cut of Department of Defense. You normally think Army would be a big player because they stayed in the human business. Navy got out of the human business in the 70s. And the largest component of that graduating class just happened to be Navy. Yeah. Uh, also would include um, officers from the FBI and some other places. So to answer your question, um, got it, recognized it, we're funded, we have a game plan that's being rebuilt in a very robust way. The example you use is exactly right. What's being said in a place that we would need to know with some <coughs> insight and understanding of the give and take. Um, we're on a rebuilding path and uh, we'll be better served for it. So uh, human is back in a big way. We have a national human manager, or now referred to as NCS, the National Clandestine Service. So as the director of CIA, it doesn't mean the CIA will do all human, but you, to do human, you do it consistently with trade craft and policy and oversight and process, that you have consistency, similar to the way that uh, the director of NSA oversees uh, signals intelligence for the U.S. government. So recognize them as being correct. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Carl Sears with NBC News. How do you evaluate and counteract the presence of thousands of Al-Qaeda-inspired jihadist websites? They're being used for recruitment, planning, propaganda. How closely do you track that phenomenon? And is there a protocol for cyber attacks that take down sites that are threatening? Yes. <laughs> You, uh, I'll answer that question if you, if you share with me. Have you stopped beating your mother yet? <laughs> That's, uh, you, you, probably, you do understand that it was difficult for me to answer that question here in, in the public and so on. So I recognize all the things that you raised and it's been appropriately addressed. And that's about as much as I want to say. <laughs> it gives me an opportunity to go back to language. I missed it part of your question earlier. Um, the mindset for this community post World War II and Cold War, is your first generation American citizen, and you have relatives in a foreign country, you're not eligible for this community. The rationale was, well, you could be blackmailed, and we really trust this person, and so on. We've got to change the way we think. If we're going to capture language, cultural understanding, insights, <coughs> and so on, we have to go back to being willing to do that. So as a policy matter, we're putting significant interest on language skills and cultural understanding that's very different from our focus in the past. So it's a, it's a cultural mindset shift. Can't do it overnight, but we need to increase the diversity of the community and we need to have people who speak and look like areas that we would have to target given that threats are coming from those areas. So it's, it's an area of significant emphasis. Last thing I would say about um, language is we have an outreach to the academic community, and what we are the, the purpose of our outreach is to expose more undergraduates to the community and what our needs are, and how exciting this business can be, and so on, and to encourage um, very interesting languages uh, for uh, intense study, for which they will be significantly rewarded. <laughs> It's a, it's a work in progress, um, <coughs> understood, and we're making some, we're making some progress. Yes, sir, and we'll go back to that. Uh, Steve Lemon, I'm a law student and researcher for PNSR, focusing on uh, information sharing. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what kind of machine you're available or what you're looking at maybe doing to institute a uniform policy for using sensitive but unclassified information to kind of reduce the uh, widespread use of that. I'm not sure I understand your question yet. To, uh, to, to use more of it or to... No, it's a kind of institute uniform policy throughout the government. So right now you've got 56 different types of classifications and almost every agency has their own way of using it. Is there any way to institute a uniform policy that the same way you've just got top secret... Oh, sure. Okay. okay. I understand. I'm, I'm 
sorry to understand your question. Uh, you're right. Um, there is a set of rules that establish uh, unclassified, <coughs> confidential, secret, top secret. And then each time you cross to a different department or agency, you, you get another version of that. And then you get these other more esoteric, esoteric classifications. What we're attempting to do is get that uniform. And uh, the policy for that is uh, many people look at it as the DNI or the intelligence community. We're about 4% mm, of the volume in terms of clearances and so on. And uh, the policies, the, the owner of the policy is um, LMB. Uh, we have uh, had a discussion with LMB and uh, had a, an agreement with them on a pilot to see if we can do a series of things. Uh, one is to make the clearance process go faster. Let's do it commercial style, which is 10 days instead of 12 months. Let's change the monitoring process to be life cycle monitoring as opposed to do it once and forget it for a year. And we want to take up what you're talking about. How you get uniformity across the government as to how you classify our channel or cause information to get uh, segregated in a way that you, you have some commonality across the across the intersect. And that wouldn't back this one. In the Denise Burgess with the Special Inspector General for Iraq and Construction. In the session prior to uh, your speech today, we were talking about change management. We talked about signing an agreement with 16 different agencies. And just thinking about what we talked about earlier, I'm, I'm curious about what kinds of incentives have you either put in place or going to put in place to get these people to all work together? And also in terms of change management, because these are two important things that underpin making it work. How deeply have you gone into those 16 organizations to get the buy-in at the middle level and the lower levels where it really works or doesn't work? Uh, let me talk to change management first. Uh, I'm not an expert, um, but I've stayed at the Holiday Inn. The <laughs> 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 company that I was in, uh, this was an area of service to a wide variety of clients. And um, I got to talk to people who were expert, and I watched the process. And the appropriate way to do it is not the way I'm doing it. Let me just say it up front. Uh, if you're going to try to change, have cultural change, uh, the best thing is to have a vision and a process and, and you, you work together and you have breakout groups and you cause the people who, who are the subject of the cultural transformation to create the process and then you get buy-in. Um, I have 543 days left. This is a huge community. So I like to do it the right way, uh, so I decided to do it the moderate way. Uh, I'm going to hold them hostage to the promotion. Uh, so I'm incentivizing it by saying, uh, if you want to get promoted, you got to do this. Now, one of the things that's very controversial, because the federal government has a process for the way it does uh, appraisals or evaluation. Uh, as a product of that, I can share with you, I don't think I ever had a fair, honest, true evaluation in my entire career. They were grossly inflated. <laughs> the first one I received in industry, I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to make it here. <laughs> the process was 360. What does that mean? Someone not in your chain of command, before I have no best of interest other than to get the truth. Um, 360 degrees. Seniors, peers, the most important turns out, subordinates and clients. And then the context was developmental. It was person to do whatever they do. How could they be better? And when, if we can set it up that way, it's 360. And then whoever does this appraisal sits down with the team and debrief it. And the team needs to say, well, it's about right. Well, what about this? Well, and you sort of agree to it. Now you have a very powerful and accurate document to present to someone about their performance. You need more emphasis here. Or, you know, Here's some things you need to change. And the first time I was exposed to this, I said, it won't work. You can't really change anyone's behavior. I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen. Remember now, prior to the military, I don't think I ever completed a two-year assignment. You go someplace, you got the team, you do the best you can with what you have, and move the next one. I learned the industry is a little different. Uh, it tends to be in place for a long term. Well, this community is not like the military. It tends to stay. So if you get a 360 
and it's done by someone outside your chain of command, you start to break some of the old structure. Then you say, if you want to be promoted, join us. So I think we've got some tools that will let us do cultural transformation. Is it enough? Uh, well, I hope so. Uh, will we have to do more? Perhaps. And if we can just get the framework right, and if I'm gone in 543 days, um, and we write it down so somebody has to struggle with changing it, then maybe the next person can take it to the next level. If I had more time, um, I'd write a shorter letter. But i got to go fast. Yes, sir, back. I would be proud of the Homeland Security Policy Institute and other things. Um, you mentioned earlier remarks of uh, the ultra secret need to know uh, containing information within the so called intelligence community. As you know very well, we live in a world today of open systems, open sources. Uh, I don't know what the total population of the official intelligence community is, but I imagine it's something on the order of 100,000 people. The blogosphere has 50 to 100 million people exchanging information, multimedia information about everything in the world, all over the world, all the time. If the public's intelligence capability, both in terms of expertise, technology, and real-time information, exceeds that of the so-called intelligence community, or even parallel to it, what's, what does that imply about, about the process of reform and the future of intelligence? Uh, pretty bright, as a matter of fact. Um, let me start by saying BS, and that stands for bright stuff. <laughs> BS at the speed of light is still BS. So 50 million people exchanging it doesn't make it right. It means it's BS at the speed of light. Bright stuff. <laughs> so what we're after is ground truth, and we have the advantage of all the BS plus secrets. So the trick for us is how do we take advantage of the blogosphere, the 99.9% the of the information is public domain, and be smart enough to capture that and still do the secret part. So uh, I think it's a work in progress. We, we have an open source center. Uh, it mostly does open source. The challenge for us, I think, is how do we take the, the all source analysts that's expert in signals intelligence or human intelligence or imagery or whatever the so skills are, and also do the thing you just described. Um, work in progress. I will recognize it. We have policies to deal with it, and we're trying to improve that, that process. But 99.9% .9 of the world's information is not necessarily available, but it's unclassified. And so how do you get access to it and manage it in a way that you can have instant command of it? And the tools and the techniques and the capabilities we have today Tremendous advantage, and it's Google for you know by another name. One of the things I would like to do, I mentioned acquisition reform earlier. What I'd like to do is to push the state of the art to be able to harness all that stuff, to sort it out in a way that makes it more useful to the analyst who does have the 0.0% bit of the information is classified, put it together in a more comprehensive way. Thank you all.